Hello to everybody. I don't know how many uh, attendees do we have in this panel, but it is definitely a very exciting panel with a very uh, interesting group of people from all over the world. Uh, our subject is ESG, which is a hot topic these days. Uh, and I think uh, I really like the title, uh, a matter, as a matter of trust. How do you share what you do with ESG as a matter of trust? I think trust is the key to or any organization for its success, and it has to gain its uh, trust with all the stakeholders, not only for risk management, but also for value creation. And uh, also, I think, for sustainability of itself. Because if you lose the trust, you lose the customers, you lose the partners, and you may even lose the social license to operate. Uh, if you uh, take a defensive approach to ESG matters, it is like playing for a draw in a soccer team. But when you play for a draw, that's the maximum you will get. You have to play for a win, and playing for a win is creating value based on ESG matters. So uh, I would like to uh, start with Marcelo, who is uh, joining us from London today. Uh, Marcelo, you have a very broad experience, both as an executive and a non-executive board member. How do you see these the differences between these roles, especially with regards to dealing with ESG matters? Well, uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone, <laughs> wherever you guys are. <laughs> wherever you're joining from, exactly. Yes, wherever you guys are. It's a great pleasure to be here today with everyone. And, um, well, to address your question, I would say um, I see this as a collaboration. There's, there has to be a, a strong and 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 con and and strong collaboration between the board and the senior management team. That's the way I see it. Of course, board members have the responsibility of starting the process and acting as a guardian for for ESG goals. But without having the rest of the team, senior management team, and actually all the employees. Uh, we won't get anywhere, actually, because um, it starts with the board member aligning the general strategy of the company with ESG goals. Uh, but after that, it's very important that um, we get the support for, from the senior management team to implement, because the senior management team is the one responsible to implement the goals and everything. So in my opinion, it starts with the board and then aligning the general strategy of the business um just uh, having a, a close conversation with the senior management team and 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 then and then the start the start of the process is 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 done however this is not a one-way street of course right so the senior management team who is responsible for the implementation of the strategy um had the responsibility to feed the board back, right? Otherwise, it's going to be something designed by the board, but sometimes that will lose contact with reality. So it starts with the board. Then we have the senior management team implement that and feeding back the board with answers or, or challenges that they might find um, when implementing that. I just want to highlight one thing that it's very, uh, uh, that I have noticed in the last years. Um, we're usually talking about the senior management team and the board, but uh, employees at the lower levels or starting positions have contributed a lot for the ESG goals. Uh, initially, we, we didn't imagine that because we thought, okay, this is going to be designed by the board, shared with the senior management team, and everyone else is going to be responsible for that. However, uh, employees that are junior employees, they have this ability to have to be in direct contact with clients, with communities, with everyone else, 
perhaps because they are in a large number, we cannot forget that we have to hear back from them. And what I have heard from them are very useful and grateful um, uh, feedback, actually, because some of the goals that probably are designed or, 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 or reached by um, the senior management team together with the board members sometimes are not possible to be implemented. And that's how we, we that's where the, the junior employees have to, the, the, have to play a, a, a crucial role, uh, feeding back the entire structure with the possibilities or not possibilities of implementing real actions at the lower level. So this is actually, in the end, in my opinion, it's a two-way street. Even though the board has the, um, uh, has the goal and has the responsibility of starting that um, and then talk to the senior management team and, and talk to the lower level employees, the junior employees, it's very crucial and important that employees feedback to the senior management team and to the board. So in the end, it's, it's a matter of collaboration and it's a matter of creating. And that's, again, the board responsibility. It's a matter of creating a two-way street where you can go from the chairman of the board to the uh, trainee and then feedback to the board. And, and, and that conversation is just crucial for me. Um, there's, there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration. And the only way we're going to get through this is implementing a two-way street. Thank you. Well, basically, governance and management are like yin and yang. Uh, <laughs> jointly, they make up a whole, and they have to fit together well. And the role of the board is basically guidance and oversight, so asking the right questions and so forth, and probably bringing the uh, options and proposals is the responsibility of the management because they uh, have to deliver on those promises in the end. So thank you very much for uh, making this note on their uh, relevance. We are conducting an interesting project uh, in our foundation, the academy, uh, where we are looking at the uh, top 200 companies with regards to their sustainability performance and how they are providing governance on the ESG matters, whether or not they have the right composition, whether or not they have the right processes and so forth. And there are very interesting uh, examples if you want to uh, follow that up. Uh, now I'd like to go to Anushka, uh, especially for public companies. What are the developing requirements for disclosure and transparency for listed entities and how do they impact the capital markets? Hi everyone, Anushka, and thank right? you, um, uh, uh, Dr. Yilmaz. Um, I think, what, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. I think for listed companies in any stock exchange um, in any country, there's a whole lot of compliance factors that companies have to adhere to, which obviously becomes part of the uh, governance reporting. So some of this is mandatory disclosure, uh, and some of it also becomes voluntary disclo disclosure for companies uh, where they take into account the integrated reports, their websites, um, you know, how companies actually have the uh, public relations um, uh, providing reports to the market. And, and, and over the last couple of years, we've seen quite a number of listed and unlisted companies starting to provide climate change data and disclosure to uh, various companies. So this also becomes part of disclosure that's available to the market and allows for transparency. Um, and I think one of the things that's becoming very, very critical is how companies are also disclosing on their websites, their policies, their processes, but also the news feeds that we uh, that we previously uh, looked at from a disclosure perspective in terms of just stock price movement. But now companies um, and capital markets are starting to look at that uh, information that is uh, voluntary disclosure, which is in an unstructured basis, and structuring that information into ESG variables. 
So we're seeing that quite, uh, you know, quite a bit coming through from a lot of the rating companies. And we're also seeing that capital market players are starting to take uh, cognizance of unstructured data and then um, uh, using different machine learning and artificial intellig intelligence tools uh, to unpack ESG factors for uh, underlying counters. And this has a huge impact in the capital markets and capital market players in terms of discount rates that are being applied to valuations of stocks and also looking at the expected loss calculations of um, fin for financial institutions, which ultimately impacts the cost of borrowings for financial institutions that are receiving money from the wholesale market. So, um, you know, ultimately, we are starting to see that transparency uh, is being measured against both voluntary and mandatory disclosure, which then ultimately moves into looking at structured and unstructured data and uh, how capital market players are using that in terms of the discount rates as well as interest rates or expected loss. Um, calculations of financial institutions. So I think, you know, that's becoming more and more of, um, of a trend amongst uh, players in the market. Over to you, Doc. Thank, thank you very much. And especially you're coming from South Africa, and South Africa is uh, particularly shining with respect to reporting, integrated reporting, assuming integrated reporting which gives a much broader perspective on all different types of capital and so forth. And uh, pretty soon, uh, integrated reporting and SASP will be joining together uh, to form certain standards uh, for value reporting foundation. I think these standards are increasing and the pressure to publish and transparency, increased transparency is definitely increasing in these areas. Now I'd like to move to Matthew Trepanier. Uh, life is becoming difficult for companies. It is not only about making money. We see increasing demands on companies and brands to take positions on topics that are sometimes even controversial, such as uh, not only environmental sustainability, uh, but more uh, like voting rights, police brutality, human rights, foreign policy, privacy, abortion rights, etc., AI ethics, those types of many issues. Uh, what are the risks associated with taking stands in these areas? And could you uh, share some examples from your experience on how to do it properly? Sure. Well, big topics, uh, big topics. So um, um, I think we've all noticed that um, th there's a trend on, on companies taking position, uh, feeling they have to take a position on controversial topic. Uh, if we think back just a few years ago, it seems that most companies would have done whatever they could to stay on the sideline of many issue or any issue that's that's really controversial, um, <clears throat> with a few, with, with very few exceptions. Um, while while today we see a willingness uh, in many cases to engage, and, and uh, so just a few examples maybe to set set the scene. I'm sure you, you're familiar with some of them. Uh, so Nike, for example, uh, with their support of uh, professional athletes that stood up against police brutality is a, is a famous recent example. Um, Delta Airlines, <clears throat> just a few years ago, after a, a shooting in a school in Florida, the Brooklyn school shooting, decided to eliminate a discount that it afforded to members of the National Rifle Association when these members uh, traveled to their annual meeting. Uh, and, and that was, um, that led to some pushback, uh, both, both by the, by some members, but also politically in Texas. <clears throat> There was some retaliation against uh, Delta. Um, many companies we've all seen recently from Coca-Cola to American Airlines to Goldman and, and many others taking very firm stance on um, the, the voting bill in Georgia, <clears throat> um, showing their opposition clearly to, to that bill. Um, also Nike and Apple <clears throat> um, wading into the debate on uh, potential human, right, uh, human rights violation with forced labor with the Uyghurs in China and many others. And, and you've mentioned privacy, AI, ethics, and, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so it's, it seems that companies today feel uh, that either the consumers or the employees demand that they take position. And, and in a way, um, you know, the, the world is very polarized today. And, and so it feels like we want <clears throat> the organization, the brands that we associate with 
to share our values, our beliefs, some of our assumptions. <clears throat> and, 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 and that doesn't seem it's going to go away. When we look at surveys, we see that the younger the people are, the more they expect companies to take a position. So if we look at boomers, it, it typically will be in a, you know, somewhat below 50%. Uh, when you look at millennials, you're in the mid 60s, uh, approaching 70%. And you also see that when you look at the corporate hierarchy, the higher up you go, the, the less uh, um, <clears throat> willing you want to take position. But that is growing even at that level. So this is now surpassing 50% of, of uh, CEOs of, of large companies. So it's definitely something that um, that takes place. And, and there are, as, as you mentioned in the outset, there are very significant both risks and benefits to, uh, to doing that because by um, taking positions on some of these topics, these, uh, an organization can basically gain support from uh, stakeholders, whether well, employees, consumers, suppliers, you name it. Uh, but also uh, by nature of these topics being controversial, you risk uh, antagonizing some stakeholder groups as well. And so the, the key I think here is really uh, to really understand the stakeholders to really uh, do your research and, and, and understand their culture, understand their beliefs, their assumptions, their trigger points. And, and, many, and in many cases, not obvious. Uh, and they're not obvious because, um, because of the polarized world we live in, uh, we have less and less of an intuition about what the other is really thinking about, caring about, and so on. We all live in our uh, information bubble uh, and so on. So it's harder to have this intuition now. <clears throat> Uh, the, the second thing is, is we need to ask ourselves, um, is there a need for us to take a position? Is there a social need? Are our stakeholders really, re you know, expecting us to take a position? Uh, a third element is, um, <clears throat> is there some relevance to our organization, to our brand? A good example here is Microsoft taking position on immigration reform. Um, in good part because uh, access to talented people wherever they might be coming from is key for the tech industry. Uh, so it's relevant for them. Um, uh, another dimension is, are we, um, is it going to seem acceptable if we take a position? Uh, do we have permission to take that position? And, and here we might think of Pepsi. Uh, they do many great things, but uh, so in, in, in this case, they wade into the pub police brutality topic uh, recently and that, that blew up. They, the, the stakeholders didn't think they had permission to, to go into that topic. It wasn't relevant directly to their brand and so on. So that's something to, to think through, to have a diverse set of perspectives before we go, uh, we go there. And, and the last point is, is many of these topics are interconnected. <clears throat> and these interconnections are not necessarily obvious. So if I take a position on environmental sustainability, maybe implicitly I'm taking a position on fair trade. Uh, and, and understanding these potential interconnections, the way they're perceived by the stakeholders can be, can be interesting. In, in, in recent research we've done, for example, we saw that uh, when companies made commitments to clean water, it, it led to an Im increased perception of, of the quality of their product. Right, so these are some just an example of, of these yeah. things. You have these uh, implicit conduits, and so it's important to understand uh, what other things you might be walking into as you take as you take position. But definitely fascinating, fascinating topic that's going to be with us for a while. Thank you very much. The lessons that I take from your talk is that uh, perhaps uh, the CEO is changing from the role of a general to a statesman or an ambassador. Uh, is one of the uh, definitely topics. And an another one is perhaps we need to do stakeholder engagement, but we have to make sure that it's an inclusive one. And third is talk only about topics that you know about or that are relevant for you, and don't jump on uh, on the gun on every issue. So these are the lessons that uh, you seem to be uh, focusing on. Uh, I'd like to turn on to Evgenia Shamis, who joined us as well, uh, particularly because she's bringing, uh, she's dealing with lots of generations. So, and uh, the topic of our subject matter was uh, about the trust towards ESGs. However, uh, particularly generations like the millennials, G Generation X, baby boomers, don't trust or uh, trust ESG. Uh, how do they change? And I would like to have her opinions from her experience about how different generations deal with uh, these ESG matters and how do they trust the corporations about their handling of ESG. Evgenia, 
Are you there? She is there, but I can't hear her. I guess she joined as a participant, so I'm inviting her to get on the stage rather than a speaker, but let's see if we can manage that. <laughs> yeah, I invite her to be on stage. This one doesn't seem to work. Again, I could... If you are hearing us, could I ask you to join as a participant and I'll uh, move on to Rosario Angelo with a different question, obviously, because of her his uh, different experience. You, Rosario, you are particularly uh, yeah. experienced in risk management, cyber risk and so forth. How do you think this ESG matters uh, are tied to this area? Obviously, cybersecurity is one of the ESG areas or risk areas. But apart from that, uh, how do we utilize these areas for uh, the whole bandwidth of the ESG? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it is, uh, it is very much related. In fact, uh, even here in our country, uh, if I'm going to uh, to discuss about uh, fintech companies, which I I, I used to to, uh, to work for to work with as well, uh, data privacy is uh, very very uh, crucial for for uh, consumers for uh, customers. So it is important for uh, for uh, financial services company fintech companies and other other uh, companies actually to ensure protection of data of uh, their customers. Um, yeah, because uh, we've uh, some companies here have received pushback and uh, not only on the uh, ethical side of things, but also on the pragmatic aspect, which is, uh, I think, uh, Anushka and, uh, and uh, Matthew also discussed a while ago uh, on, on the regulatory aspect as well, which, of course, may have a pragmatic impact, I mean, uh, due to regulatory fines and, of course, uh, customer uh, moving to other, uh, uh, to other uh, uh, providers uh, in terms of uh, market uh, penetration. And uh, and and that's and uh, as uh, as uh, Marcelo also mentioned a while ago that it is crucial for uh, for the two-way street uh, that that is very important for uh, for the board and also for for the senior management as to as to uh, identifying uh, which uh, which are important for uh, for the, for the different stakeholders and that includes employees and customers as well and of course uh, regulatory uh, regulatory bodies which. Uh, I mean, oftentimes uh, companies view them as, you know, as uh, like an opponent, but rather uh, rather consider them as as, as an opportunity to uh, to be partners and to partner with them to ensure that uh, we are compliant in, in this uh, information security and uh, data privacy uh, aspects. And uh, yeah, just just remembering, uh, you know, John Elkington's. Uh, Three piece of sustainability, uh, people, planet, and profit. So I somehow really is, this is it. This is uh, ESG, and uh, and uh, we've seen we've been seeing that, uh, especially in this uh, in this uh, pandemic, which is very relevant to BPOs. We are uh, one top one top two a BPO in the world. I mean, the Philippines uh, as uh, as as really known for for its uh, business process and uh, outsourcing. So yeah, these are these are all. Uh, uh, this all plays a very important uh, role uh, in ensuring that we take care of the ESG matters for, for our company. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Imas. Thank you, Rosaro. Uh, let me go back to uh, Matthew. Uh, Matthew, trust is the essence of good governance and foundation for sustainable development. And uh, people are not only trying to do uh, build trust as an adjunct, but rather uh, try to build business models based on uh, trust and uh, concerns of consumers and stakeholders. Is this trend uh, a transient trend or is it here to stay? And uh, what are the steps businesses need to take to make sure that uh, the trust that they build stays here for the long term? All right. 
very interesting topic. So um, a short answer is I, I think very much it's here to stay and then hopefully some of the, the reasons why will we'll come out in the next uh, few minutes. But but um, I think it's a, it's a fascinating topic. If we think 15, the back to, to past 15, 20 years, we keep hearing that um, you know organizations have to become more customer centric, customer focused. And and what that means in practical terms, basically, is we're moving away from selling products or selling services, and we're selling solutions and experiences. And and to be able to succeed at that, we have to understand um, our audiences very deeply. Uh, we have to understand their desires, their beliefs, their needs, and, and so on. So we get closer to the consumers. And in getting closer, we establish that relationship and, and um, <clears throat> we become more of a trusted party potentially. <clears throat> and that's, of course, it has very strong benefits because it's hard to imitate these trust relationships and so on. So there's a competitive advantage to, to do it. Um, but the, there's, there's a flip side that I, I find fascinating, which is uh, <clears throat> when there's a perception of that trust being breached, <clears throat> it's a very different situation than if, let's say, my business model is based on a product, it's product quality, and, and somehow that particular outcome was not high quality enough. Um, the, the implications and the solutions that are very different. Right? So if I breach trust, uh, the trust of someone, it can generate very strong negative feeling, feelings of betrayal. And and so just to illustrate an example, so if I if I have let's say I'm selling coffee, uh, and and you come to my shop and and you come to my shop because you like the quality of my coffee and somehow the coffee I, I give you is a little bit old and and not not as good as you expect, you might come back to the counter. I give you a fresh one, maybe a free key, maybe a discount for next time. You're happy and and everything is solved, right? But if if you come to my shop because you think I have great coffee, but also because we share the same set of values that, that we both think that we should protect the environment and we were both against poly brutality and so on. And somehow, no relation to you experiencing my coffee or coming into my shop, but somehow uh, through the news, through your social network and so on, you learn that maybe I don't really have all these positions. <clears throat> you might feel that I've betrayed your trust and that might lead to a very strong uh, reaction on your part. Now, it's a different animal to uh, to manage these these business models and these um, if they're based on trust versus um, the more traditional elements of product quality innovation and product and so on. Yes, so so that is particularly relevant because these controversial issues, uh, by nature, they because they're controversial by definition. Different stakeholders will have radically different views, uh, and they will hold these views very strongly. So whenever I take a position, I'm bound to offend uh, some people and to generate <clears throat> this counter reaction. Right? And so the more we have people wanting companies to take positions, the more we have these socially controversial issues, uh, the more we're likely to have these challenges. <clears throat> and so they'll need to be uh, to be managed in, in, in delicate ways. <clears throat> um, so so to your question on 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 building trust. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> First, it's very complex. Uh, we have to understand the different issues very deeply to understand different stakeholders. Um, <clears throat> we have to um, engage in a way that's going to be authentic and transparent. All the stakeholders will ex will expect that. We have to exercise empathy, and, and as I alluded to in the first uh, in the first first bit, it's increasingly difficult to empathize right? because of this. Polarization that we all see, um, it's hard to put myself in the shoes of somebody with a different view. Uh, I don't know if you've tried, but whatever your political views, try to watch for a few hours straight of uh, either a news channel or a YouTube influencer that that, held, that holds very different political views than you. Uh, and, and after a few hours, I guarantee you, it's quite difficult. And, and that's the same thing when we, whenever we try to have that empathy to really understand how the others will perceive our actions and whether they'll give us uh, their trust. Uh, so empathy is key and it's it's increasingly difficult. Uh, commitment is, is, is important to see also. So the organization has to show that they're really committing to a certain outcome, a certain solution, to uh, doing what's right for the stakeholders. Um, <clears throat> and then having some competence. So being able to do the right thing in the right way with the, the outcome that's going to be expected. And then once you've built that trust, that if that was not hard enough, of course, you have to protect it and to maintain it. 
because it's going to be challenged by the very nature of these controversies. And, and sometimes you're going to be trusted into these controversies. It's not going to necessarily be a choice. So we've talked about these situations being decisions by companies, but sometimes these decisions are at least they're implicit. There's a very uh, interesting example just a few days ago with a, a startup insurance company called Lemonade uh, that uses artificial intelligence to adjudicate claims. So basically, if you have a claim, you submit a video of yourself explaining the claim, and the AI will look at the video and a bunch of other things uh, to make its decision. And, and, and of course, uh, many groups are now saying, well, you know, what is picked up by that AI in the video? Um, if I'm black, if I'm Asian, um, <clears throat> if I'm male, female, I mean, all sorts of things, um, <clears throat> you know, could, could I be discriminated against? So this company didn't uh, took really a position, but by nature of the technology they're using, they're trusted into that uh, controversial space now. Yeah. Basically, you are differentiating between transaction-based relationship to trust-based relationship. Transaction-based uh, relationship can resume even after there is some failure. But if you break trust, you're likely to go for a divorce. <laughs> yes, and, and you have to you have to keep the right lens. Very often in the corporate world, we think transactionally, and sometimes even our business model is is trust-based, but we still think transactionally. And so we have to keep same glasses as the business model. Yeah, I'd like to go to Marcelo because he has experience not only in the business world but also in voluntary organizations and education organizations. For a more sustainable world, these types of organizations need to work together. What are the synergy areas and what kind of lessons uh, can you draw from your broad experience, Marcelo? Your voice, open up your mic, please. Yes, okay. uh, thank you, Doctor. Um, I think as you mentioned, um, it's a matter of collaboration again, um, because we have to remember that without collaboration, we won't get anywhere. Um, and I see the collaboration between NGOs slash charities and for-profit companies uh, 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 something, uh, something crucial to 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 take the next step. We cannot forget that NGOs are, by definition, they are tackling ESG topics uh, for many, many decades. So they pretty much know a lot about those topics. Even even before we came up with the uh, with the um, letters ESG, what were charities and NGOs doing, if not dealing with that, right? If dealing with uh, minorities, dealing with uh, um, environmental issues and things like that. So as, as, as a for-profit company, you have a lot to learn from NGOs. Uh, first, the reason I just mentioned, they've been dealing with this for, some of them for centuries, if not decades and, and, and so on, okay? Um, another advantage I see coming from the NGOs and charity is pretty much that um, they, they, they have a, a large number of point of contact. So um, uh, uh, they, they, they are everywhere. And usually because they have a large number of volunteers, they can reach out to a lot of people. And, 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 and most of those volunteers are people who have actually been in a difficult situation, for example, right? Um, if uh, uh, someone was born in a very poor area, for example, in, in Brazil or in Africa or whatever, might, become an, might come out of this situation and then volunteer for the same NGO. NGO. So again, it's, it's, it, they have more contact. They, have more, they are closer to the situation. And again, that is something that unique and, 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 and for-profit companies can learn a lot from that. And the last, the, last, the last topic that I see NGOs or can contribute a lot to this uh, collaboration is pretty much uh, uh, the expertise to engage people. So don't, don't forget, usually NGOs and charities have a, a smaller budget. So they have, they have to have this skill of engaging people, selling the vision. And, and then in, in case of ESG, it's, it, it's a lot about selling the vision and everything else. So those are the three uh, pillars that I, I believe NGOs can bring to the table. Um, on the side of for-profit companies, um, it's again, it's very important that we can forget they can bring a lot of investment 
to that topic, right? So, and they can bring a lot of publicity and, and to that topic. Again, it's it's very important. So, for a profit company, usually they have a larger budget. They they know how to 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 make something uh, visible and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And a specific thing that I I've been found out um, when talking to charities that for profit companies have brought a lot of tools um, in terms of KPIs and things for for the for the for the charities and the ESG work. For example, take the big four, take PwC for example, or any other big four um, company, and you will see that those sophisticated tools, sophisticated tools that. Uh, are usually used by very sophisticated investment bankers or whatever, are now being brought to the table to somehow track the KPIs when it comes to ESGs and, and, and everything else. So again, it, it's, it, it's the collaboration in, in, in each part of this uh, group. On one side, the NGOs and charities and education um, and, and companies. On the other side, the for-profit companies. I think both groups can bring a lot to the table when it comes to do a successful um, ESG implementation, the slash strategy, and everything else. Thank you very much. We have a lot of experience in all of those domains as well, and uh, I'd like to summarize uh, your points by uh, NGOs can bring more uh, inclusiveness, better understanding of the society and the issues, and even better management of the Z generation, because dealing with volunteers is very much like that. Uh, and the companies can bring more discipline, know-how, systems, which makes a difference in terms of implementation as well as uh, resources. And their uh, joint work really brings huge benefits to the society if they can manage to uh, pull it together. Let me go to Anushka. Uh, a major concern with ESG issues is greenwashing. How can this be recognized and what tools are available to assist uh, uh, us uh, keeping the uh, conscious leadership. Um, thanks, Doc. I, I'm, I've been listening to my colleagues and, and, and just listening to what Matthew was talking about in terms of trust and uh, taking into account, you know, stakeholders and, um, uh, you know, some of the controversial issues and views that are out there and what happens to brand management and uh, uh, with the company going forward. I think, you know, what what I've seen um, is that big data and artificial intelligence machine learning basically provides you with that information uh, upfront in terms of trying to uh, create the empirical evidence of um, uh, of companies whether they're doing something right or wrong. And you know, transparency and ethical leadership, as we all know, creates this conscious capital and conscious leadership. However, it's very easy to greenwash, especially when you have good, big budgets and you have very good PR and you have great investor relations, right? And and that's where big data and artificial intelligence and machine learning comes in. So what, what I've seen, um, and, uh, you know, lots of companies across the globe, they have very good ESG ratings. And I, I don't want to name the, the companies. Uh, um, um, Matthew is much braver than companies with high ESG ratings, but very, very poor uh, considerations for environmental issues, very poor considerations for social issues. You just pick up, uh, you know, they um, go onto the website and you are able to very, very easily see gender equality, gender inequality. You are able to see whether there is a uh, transformation from bottom up, top down, so machine learning and artificial intelligence allows you uh, very easily to pick up your negative news feeds. It's able to look through uh, the, uh, the big data that is available through websites uh, uh, from uh, stock markets, from other stakeholders, and bring all of that together in terms of them measuring different target variables. So what we've seen very often is what, you know, as an asset manager, as a financial institution, because ultimately that kind of hubs up the, uh, the, all your, your listed companies, right, uh, in terms of who lends to them and who invests in them. And uh, so if, you, if, if you're looking at just the, the disclosure from an integrated report perspective, you're looking at 
uh, what they're disclosing on the websites, uh, it's not enough. So you've got to go into the various stakeholders, and those stakeholders come through uh, different avenues of uh, of reporting, which is uh, through news feeds, social media, and so forth. And then you've got to measure that against target variables. And target variables is generally the stock price, uh, looking at your your EBIT, looking at your margins, looking at your capitalization, and not looking at a point in time, but actually over a central tendency or uh, an, a long run average, so that you are able to measure that against um, you know information that's being published. And you are able to then gauge, is there greenwashing or there's actual true leadership and true conscious capital and conscious leadership coming through from a company. And so as much as I love the, the fluff that comes around uh, ESG, for me, it's about the, the math. Empirically prove to me that you're actually good at what you're saying you're doing. And, uh, and if you're able to do that, I'll invest in you. I will, uh, you know, ensure as a financial institution, I'll lend to you. And ultimately, that has a huge impact uh, on the circular economy, um, as well as, uh, you know, the cost borrowings and the valuations uh, going forward. And more importantly, in terms of the future that we are trying to build with leadership uh, and not really, um, you know, allowing leadership to get away, your millennials will not allow that. And uh, and I think uh, it comes back to, uh, ultimately managing uh, a risk factor that is extremely important for the world. Uh, we have one planet and let's protect it. We have one society, we in- interconnected, whether I live in Africa, whether you live in Brazil or Europe, if you don't do it together, uh, it, it, it's not going to make a difference to anybody. Yeah. Thank you, Doc. Yeah. Th- thank you. Uh, I, I, I think we need to take a very similar approach to reporting on ESG as we do with financials. If you don't have the targets, if you don't explain the gaps, uh, then uh, greenwashing is more easy because you're reporting only on what you do nice. But if you have reported on your targets, goals, and uh, uh, even if you cannot meet them, if you are serious and candid about how to remedy those gaps uh, in your reporting, I think better trust is being built. Uh, last but not least, I want to go to Rosario, uh, uh, especially with regards to artificial intelligence and so forth. Uh, there is major concern that uh, those systems will highlight the biases of those who build those systems as opposed to uh, making a level uh, playing ground. What do you think about that and how about the ethics of AI using these types of tools, especially for ESG and being responsible to our stakeholders? Well, uh, actually, uh, Anushka kind of t- uh, touched on that a while ago, right? Um, well, the biases in whatever in whatever tools or in whatever aspects of the business that we do are, are, all, are all present there. I think uh, what's important is, uh, I mean, combining all of this, uh, all of what our colleagues have said, I mean, Anushka... Uh, Marcelo and uh, and Matthew, uh, yeah, I think it's it's very important, uh, you know, that um, you know use use uh, use data, use big data, collaborate a lot more. Not only between you and your customers, between you and the regulatory uh, uh, regulatory uh, agencies. I mean, but but also but also with with amongst amongst corporations, amongst organizations, because uh, what we see now, I mean. Uh, is that uh, companies are actually working in silos. I mean, if there are sustainable development goals that, that was established by the UN and there are top priorities of government, top trending uh, issues in, in your country, for example, uh, you know, uh, uh, companies will choose whatever they want to choose, whatever their biases are. But then again, uh, just, just hypothetically, for example, if, if all companies will go for tree planting, I mean, uh, and all those companies will choose tree planting. What happens now with with the with the waste management, for example, solid waste management? So I think uh, I, I like uh, what 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 each and every uh, uh, colleague has, has, has said, one of the speaker has said, and I think yeah, collaboration and the use of proper data, understanding the stakeholder, these are all uh, important, and, and all corporations must there must be mutual agreements between corporations, between organizations to work 